Time for another story from the hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. Acosta. Hello there. We have a story tonight about one of the boom towns of the harbor that we might have slighted in previous broadcasts. We talked about Grace Harbor City, Aberdeen, Hoquiam, and Cosmopolis. We told you the yarn about Leo City that became Chehalis, and finally Westport. And we've mentioned Acosta several times, but we haven't yet taken up the story of that remarkable little city that boomed, blossomed, and faded in a span of less than ten years, leaving behind only a little settlement and a name. But before we get to our story tonight, let me tell you of something that will be of interest to Grace Harbor's old-timers. Tonight, in the council chambers of the Aberdeen City Hall, the Grace Harbor Historical Society will show the famous Charlie Pratt Slides, a collection of more than 300 slides of historical scenes of Grace Harbor. Charlie Pratt was one of the harbor's old timers. He recorded that old harbor faithfully with his camera. This set of slides made up to go to the Seattle Exposition in 1908 and 140 slides selected from those sets will be shown this evening by Frank Garrett, Aberdeen photographer. Among the pictures to be projected will be one of Hoquiam taken about the turn of the century, showing the old 8th Street Bridge, the old and very famous Hoquiam Hotel, the Plank Street, and other points of interest. It was taken from Campbell's Hill, is in color, and is one of the most interesting shots in the series. A similar view of Aberdeen taken about the same time from Think of Me Hill records the city in the first years after the fire, when the new and permanent buildings were raising, but the old plank streets remain. There are views of the wharfs of many of the harbor's old mill lined up by little sailing schooners of that day. River boats are long since gone from the harbor's busy scene and many others. The showing is open to the public and will begin at about 8.30. It's a great chance to see some of Gray's Harbor that we've been talking about. Meanwhile, we'll get along with the story about the boomtown Acosta, its rise and decline. But first, let's have a few words from Dick Crombie and our sponsor. Acosta was a spot of importance to the Indians long before the white people came to live here. The Native Americans called it Nusitska. The name of Acosta is credited to Mrs. George E. Philly, wife of a trustee of a land company that obtained the site and began to develop the city. William H. Calkins of Tacoma was also credited with an assistant in creating the name. They took the Spanish word La Costa, meaning the coast, for the euphony prefixed the letter O. The city was planned by the Northern Pacific Railroad, a group of Tacoma men, as the Grays Harbor Terminal for the railway, or for what was then called the Tacoma Olympia and Grays Harbor Railway, a subsidiary of the Northern Pacific. Acosta was projected in the late 1880s and actual work on developing the community began in the 1890s. It was systematically laid out and provisions were made for several industries, business section, a railroad terminal, docks, and in fact all the attributes of a city. By 1892 the steel rails of the westbound railroad had reached as far as Acosta and many residents of Grace Harbor saw the salt water of our bay for the first time from Acosta to which they had journeyed by train from the Sound. The community was boomed in Tacoma and Seattle and in fact as far east as Chicago. Mabel McKinley Hopkins, one of Grace Harbor's faithful historians, Recall seeing a big signboard advertising Acosta by the Sea near Chicago 
while on a trip there in the early 1900s. Special excursion trains were run to the harbor from Seattle and Tacoma to bring excursionists to see the ocean beaches. From Acosta, they took a little river steamer across the long dock at Westport and walked the last couple of miles on the beach. But the people inland, although they might look out their windows to see the Puget Sound, it was quite an adventure to walk on the wind-swept sand of the ocean's edge and to investigate the sea life. There was no limit on razor clams, and many of the baskets that came down from Seattle or Tacoma, heavy with fried chicken and potato salad, went back bulging with clams. And while Aberdeen and Hoquiam were languishing in the stalemate, their progress virtually stopped with the failure of the railroad to come down on this side of the harbor. Acosta boomed. By 1894, it had retail stores of almost every kind. A.W. Barclay was operating a men's finishing store with a stock that would have looked good in Seattle or San Francisco. Adolph Ponichel of Hoquiam had a tailor shop there with his father. Adolph Bolu, Adolph Bolu, longtime resident of Acosta, had a general store. The town had a bank with $25,000 capital and a weekly newspaper, the Acosta Pioneer, established in 1890 by C.J. Colin. The town boasted a lumber mill, a shingle mill, a brewery, a flour mill, and fine homes. The newspaper, the Pioneer, boasted the town with glowing editorials. The nearest port to the, to the ocean, the paper told the world that would listen. On the front page, it carried a table that told the world that would listen. And on the front page, it showed relative distance from San Francisco to Yosemite, from Portland to Yokohama, from Tacoma to Yokohama, from Acosta to Yokohama. Acosta won by nearly a hundred miles. Chicago to Hong Kong via San Francisco and via Acosta were also measured. Again, Acosta won out. Editorial, Editor Coughlin also advocated the deep sea white fish business for Acosta and the harbor which it never realized until the years of late war that they were deemed for fish brought in a heavy commercial line in that area. However, the advocacy of the white fish business led to one of the early seafood canneries on the harbor, established in Acosta by Bob Forbes, a Texas seafood packer. Bob had been packing clams and crabs in the Gulf of Mexico when he heard about the new country up in the northwest. He blew into town before the railroad, and by the time the steel rails had reached down to Acosta, Bob had a cannery up and doing business. Now, he inspected the razor clams and decided they would make good pack, so they were among the first seafood that he processed. He got in on the salmon run early in the game and canned some crab meat. Then, during an off-season, the cast about for something else to go into the eye idle plant, and the mud clams that filled the beaches along the South Bay were brought into his attention. They were big, meaty, and had good flavor, and were very much like the gold clams that he had packed in Texas. So he set up his equipment, hung out of sight, and began buying mud clams from, for experimental packing. The diggers, who were also having an off-season, it was early in the spring, were glad to get the digging. Mud clams were easy to come by, and so they brought in a grand harvest of the harbor, pro of the harbor produce. Bob put them through his cannery and stocked them in a warehouse. Since they were something new, he wanted to learn more about them before he sold them under his label. So they were stacked in boxes and waited for a few months. The processing gave the cannery a few weeks off during the off-season, and Bob was pleased with his pioneering venture. He had almost forgotten them as summer came around and the razor clams came in. His plant rolled merrily along through May, June, and July with the sea beach pack, and only very 
You know, occasionally did Bob go into the warehouse where he had canned the mud clams to inspect them. Once in a while he opened a can of his experiment and have a chowder made of its contents. Everyone pronounced them excellent. Well, it was a hot July that year and the sun beat down on the Acosta Flats and onto the shed roof of the storehouse where Bob kept his mud clams packed. The mercury soared and stayed there, and the weather, as it usually is, was a major topic of conversation in Acosta. Well, one warm afternoon, when the heat hung on into the late afternoon, and the unusual afternoon breeze had failed to turn up, the town was sitting out on its front porch, and palm leaf fans were much in evidence. A sort of sultry, dusky haze hung low over the meadows, where the little wooden city was assembled. The only sound besides the night birds coming out was an occasional whistle from the river where a riverboat headed up to the landing. Then suddenly there was a sharp crack of what sounded like a muffled gunshot, then another and another. Sometime they went off like strings of firecrackers. Then there were moments of silence, almost like pauses between fuselages to be loaded. All through the town, the residents looked across the flats behind main streets towards the waterfront for the source of the volleys. Could it be an invader? Then came another volley and shattering of glass, and the men of the town started for the waterfront, leaving the women and children behind with warnings to stay close to their house. As the band of, res of resolute men approached the shore of the bay, they located the sounds of the explosion. It was on the rake. A building of a piling adjoining Bob Forbes' cannery, and even as they approached, another volley echoed its weatherboard walls, closing in on the cannery, and hastily organizing tactile forces could tell that it was not gunfire. There was a pop to the explosion that sounded like something bursting under pressure. And when the group had assembled on the dock of the cannery, a couple of the bravest poked their head in through the broken windows to inspect the source. One glance told them all they needed to know, and they pulled their heads out hurriedly. For not only were there flying mud clams in the air, but there was flying mud flat, mud flat fragrance that sent them staggering. And through the group, the cannery, Forbes made his hurried way to unlock the door and take a quick look inside. He explained everything quickly. The clams had refused to pack properly with the Texas method that he had used. They had not been cooked long enough. Bob had made the mistake of leaving the stomachs. They had fermented. It took just such a heat as they had that day to accelerate the fermentation and they were exploding. Now the interior of the storeroom dripped with overripe mud clams. Bob wasn't worried about the clam pack. He had not, it had not been large. It was an experiment anyhow, but he did dread the job of cleaning up his storehouse that had been hosed out several times and still had a pungent odor of the mud clams. The mud clam really suffered the most, or perhaps it gained by its ornery reaction to being canned. Anyhow, no one, so far as I can discover, ever tried to can the mud clams commercially, at least in quantities, after that. And the mud clams settled down to a more peaceful life without Bob's diggers disturbing them in their beds. As for the harbor, the word got around and the folks dubbed it the Battle of the Clams and Bob Forbes got more publicity out of it than if he had canned the things perfectly and made a success of his venture. Well, that was the story of the clan battle of Acosta, but here is Dick Crombie for a word from our sponsor. It was the Depression of 1896 that broke Acosta. It had little of a commercial nature to rely on. Its harbor was not good for shipping, and the citizens of Aberdeen turned out and built their own railroad into town. That ended Acosta's monopoly on the rail terminal and also gave the north side of the harbor another lease on life. From that point on, it was just a case that the citizens of Aberdeen and Hoquim had more push 
than they did down in Acosta Way, and they took the business away from the town. In fact, they took many of its citizens, among them those we have mentioned. They even took some of the buildings, but that's another story. And in and at least one case, it's a very good story. Within a few years, Acosta's lots had cost hundreds of dollars, were advertised as this certain one in the Washingtonian. We'll trade city property in Acosta for a used bicycle. That was the end for the boom town that the Northern Pacific had backed. And in the 1930s, the town was disincorporated and given itself up. Probably it is better off today than ever. It has some fine schools, quite a few residents, and it enjoys a peaceful quietude and rural dignity that, except for legend and color, far surpass its gay 90s boom that ended in a bust. That's all for this one. Tomorrow night, we'll bring back the hometown scrapbook for another tale. Thanks for listening. Thank you.